I'm Sarah Morehouse from the Empire State College Online Library. This is the fourth unit in our series of videos about evaluating information sources for research and everyday life. In this unit, we talk about misconceptions people have about the trustworthiness and even infallibility of information sources that come from people and institutions we respect. We also talk about how we can trust information sources at all if trusting the people and organizations that created them is not enough. To give you an idea of the kind of thing we're talking about, here's a clip from a talk by Gail Bush, who is a professor in the National College of Education. While you're watching it, please think about two questions. First, what does Dr. Bush mean by authority? And second, if we're supposed to question the experts, how can we know what evidence is valid? Tree we taught that we needed to answer the question. And in the 21st century, we teach that we need to question the answer. Now, the students coming up are very uh, facile in finding information, but not very much so in evaluating it. And the teachers that we have predominantly came up in that sort of old style of learning around uh, cognitive authority, meaning that we could trust the, we, there was authority to the information sources that we used. And now we need to, we know that we cannot trust every information source that we see, and we need to know how to cr think critically around them, how to maintain that critical stance, how to employ it, and then how to stay open to new ideas and information, and to be open to change your mind if you find evidence that is valid. There's no such thing as a perfect, all-knowing, infallible human. And besides, part of becoming educated is gaining your own expertise and a basis for your own informed opinions. So instead of just trusting an information source because it's in print, or comes from a reputable name, or was given to you by someone you respect, you always have to be on the lookout for signs that it might not be trustworthy. And we will go over many of those signs in this series of videos. If the information source seems like it might be untrustworthy, you need to investigate. Then you can choose for yourself whether or not you are willing to use it. Within every information source, you will need to examine the information present for its validity, sort out correct information from incorrect, and separate fact from opinion. I read a blog called Regret the Error. It's the blog of a journalist who reports on mistakes and misleading statements made in the news. As you'll see, sometimes even the most well-regarded news sources fall short of their ideals. This article is about an NPR radio show that did an expose on working conditions in the Chinese factories that produce iPhones and other Apple products. It turned out that the person they were interviewing was making a lot of things up. The article comes to the conclusion that the radio show's fact-checking was not nearly rigorous enough. But even good fact-checking can miss things which is why it's important to maintain an open mind, but also a skeptical one. Here's another blog post from Regret the Error. This one is about how CNN and Fox News both made a huge mistake when the Supreme Court first ruled on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. They were in such a hurry that they read only the first part of the opinion and thought that the Supreme Court had struck down the Affordable Care Act as unconstitutional. Within minutes of releasing the story, they realized they had it backwards and retracted it with apologies. But sometimes even a quick retraction doesn't control the damage. Not everyone checks back, so they may not find out that the retraction even happened. What's worse is first impressions matter even more than people realize. Human beings anchor on the first thing they see or hear, and form their emotional reactions based on that. The correction doesn't make as strong an emotional impression so their judgment is still based on the incorrect information that they heard first, and not the correction that they heard later. So if even trusted news sources make these huge mistakes, what can we do to make sure we're not taken in by them? First, cross-check with other sources. If there's general agreement, then you can feel more confident in the accuracy of the information. But if all the stories are different, then you shouldn't have much confidence in any of them. And if most of them agree but one or a few disagree substantially, you'll have to look deeper into the matter. The second thing you can do is come back later and make sure that the information wasn't later retracted, updated, amended, or corrected. And finally, use your common sense. 
Use what you already know and your powers of reasoning. These same kinds of mistakes and misconduct can even make it through the peer review process of scholarly articles and monographs. Here's a post from another blog I follow called Retraction Watch. It's reporting on a scholarly article that went through peer review and got into print even though the conclusions were based on mathematical errors. Many scholarly retractions are based on this kind of thing because most fields of study require the use of statistical analysis, but not everyone is a statistical expert. Unless you're a statistical expert, there's not too much you can do to identify when mathematical issues are present except pay attention to the retractions. Journals publish retractions in every issue, so if you're concerned you can either check the Retraction Watch blog or check the following issues of the journal in which the questionable article was published. Scholarly articles are also retracted because of scholarly misconduct. Types of academic misconduct include plagiarizing other researchers, not disclosing financial conflict of interest, falsifying your data, massaging your data to say something other than what it actually says, publishing things you know aren't true, and trying to squeeze multiple publication credits out of one piece of research. Here is another blog post from Retraction Watch. This article was initially retracted because it was being published in two journals at once, which is considered cheating because you're trying to get more publication credits out of the same research. But it turns out that there were more serious reasons behind the retraction. The author, whether he was trying to deceive everyone or whether he was just deceiving himself, had written a bunch of pseudoscience. In this case, it was so obvious that an economist was able to recognize the problems, even though it was a biology article. In other cases, it's more subtle and may be out in circulation for years before someone finally realizes that the results of the study can't be replicated. It's much harder to retract a scholarly monograph. It's very unlikely that the books will be pulled from the shelves. But scholarly journals typically contain reviews of scholarly books, and if a book is deeply flawed, you'll find that information in the scholarly book reviews. One of the reasons we have the peer review system for scholarly publications is to catch those problems, but peer review isn't infallible. There are usually only two or three peer reviewers for an article, and they have their own blind spots. They have limited time and they usually don't have the option of checking every bit of data and going over all the math. Once the article or book is published, it's much more likely that someone will spot the problem because there are more eyes on it. But just like it is for retra retractions in the news, by the time you retract it, it's too late because people have already anchored on their first impression. An important thing to remember is that for every retraction that happens, there are still more mistakes and misconduct that don't get retracted. Reputable news sources and scholarly sources are reputable because they usually get it right. They're usually authoritative and reliable sources of high-quality information. But when they do slip up, it's very bad because people are trusting them, so they tend to accept the mistakes and lies without questioning. We can have the same attitude towards people we respect. If a doctor hands you a pamphlet, you usually trust what's in the pamphlet. But the truth is the doctor may have been too busy to read it herself, and she was just given it by a pharmaceutical company rep. When your professor sends you to a website, you might think that website is up to academic standards, but professors are busy people, and their expertise outside their own subject area may be limited. When a book is in a college library, you expect it to be college level, but libraries buy content in big bundles, and not every single item gets scrutinized. The solution is to always have an attitude of questioning, in other words, to have a critical attitude. In this case, critical doesn't mean negative or disapproving. Critical thinking means a way of thinking empirically, meaning based on facts and evidence from the real world, and a way of thinking logically, which means being sure of the relationships between your premises and your conclusions. Critical thinking is a way to decide if something is true, false, partly true, or sometimes true. Critical thinking identifies the right questions to ask and the problems that need to be solved. It helps you to examine your own assumptions and the assumptions that you find in the information sources you use. It helps you to recognize the attitudes and values that underlie what you believe is right and correct and what is presented as right and correct in your information source. It helps you to evaluate the validity of evidence and the reliability of conclusions.
Critical thinking isn't so much a skill as a whole set of skills, and it's something that you can get better at with practice. The next units of this Evaluating Sources video series will talk about different critical thinking skills that you can bring to bear on your re research materials and on information sources that you use in your everyday life. Please take some time to visit the Supplemental Resources link that's listed on the video information page. In Supplemental Resources, you'll find the links to the Retraction Watch blog and the Regret the Error blog. Look through the blogs and note the different kinds of errors and misconduct that are being reported. Ask yourself what are some of the possible consequences of some of these mistakes and ethics violations. The Supplemental Resources page also has links to other websites and videos on this topic if you want to study this topic in more detail. In the Supplemental Resources page, you'll also find a link to a very short self-quiz. When you complete the quiz, it grades itself and it will tell you what you got right and wrong. It will also explain the answers to any questions you got wrong. When the quiz is completed, you will have the option of downloading or printing a certificate, which you can use as proof that you went through the video tutorial if you need that for one of your courses.